This is a discussion that happens a lot. Yeah. Whenever we see all this shit happening on the news, yeah. we say to ourselves, damn, why don't the world respect black people in America? I want to hear your answer from your perspective, right. brother. Now, let's go to third grade. I'm going to give you a third grade lesson. And this, you can take home and do a film. As a matter of fact, have somebody film you doing this third grade lesson, right? So we're going to talk third grade grammatication. I'm going to repeat. So it's not complex, and they can criticize this paper too. <laughs> Third grade grammatication, orthology, basic reading skills. Are we clear? All right, so, so no one's, they're not insulted. All right, and they can gum off their egos. In language across the world, the fundam fundamental seed or egg to language across the planet is the etymon. The etymon is to any language from any time, from any hemisphere of the planet, the seed, the ovum, the zygote, the core of every word in every language and its morphology or transit. Are we clear? Yes. Now, the entire Contemporary world's politics is based and is founded upon the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition is the inquisition by the Popes of Rome or the Bishopric against the Moors and Yahudi, both of which are these Asiatics who now think that human beings are crayons. <laughs> no, it's just, we're talking the world, we're talking world politics. All of your secret societies, for those who rule, must take degrees on real world history. That's why they wear the Moorish fez in their rituals with jewels all over them. Because the land is called the North Gate cosmologically. It is Northwest of Mexum, Northwest Africa, Al Marak, Morocco, or the Maghrib. Morocco, the most extreme West, the great Masonic secret. It's why you have that pyramid on the note, but no one speaks under it because it belongs to these people who think human beings are crayons. So the rest of the civilized world are looking at the direct descendants of the founders of civilization that in 2015 still think that human beings are crayons, which makes them incompetent. Civilized human beings honor their mothers and fathers, their pedigree, their bloodline, for that is where your inheritance is recognized in trust law. All governments recognize your pedigree, not crayons. And what's happening with these people that keep telling you about Jesus, God, Allah, Moses, Muhammad, Yahweh? They're the only people of Asiatic African descent that continue to impose crayon identities on a civilized world, get rejected, and then accuse the civilized world of racism when race is the human species. And the human species is expanded into families called nations and nationalities. Go anywhere on the civilized planet called Earth, you will never see nation states having plaques in front of their representatives talking about Negro Dina, Color Defia, Black Adonia. All civilized people know no such people exist, 
No such nation exists. No such history exists. Such persons have those tags from Dutch masters which created those brand systems on Moors who were defeated and put under the Christian black codes as chattel property. That's how you can distinguish persons held in peonage from the civilized, which means you and I and we can get on a plane or on a train and go to any nation state on the planet. And you walk off that plane and we all family. And we say, oh brother, peace brother, salam, whatever the greeting, shalom. You understand? Hotep. And as soon as he say, if he says that he's black, automatically the codes apply to him. His brother says he's Nigerian, all international law applies to him. This brother says he's he Kupta, what you call Egypt, civilized law applies to him. He will get mistreated. As a matter of fact, unless he's with people, he can only travel in the countries on a tour. They will not be letting no black people run around amongst the civilized people. They don't do that. They only do tours. And they ain't figured this out yet. So let's go back to third grade grammatication, right? We're all adults, right? Right. Now, he has the advantage because you have knowledge. But for those who don't have knowledge, right, you're not, they're not going to instill certain keys in them because they're not aware that status is everything in society. Status determines the capacities, the incapacities, and the state or condition that any human being on the planet has in relationship to third parties and the state. That's universal, so not just here. You tell that to most of our people and they immediately start talking about racism and prejudice. But that applies all around the world. They don't know it because the Europeans have controlled their education, their miseducation, put it this way. Back to third grade grammatication. All right, adults, now we're, this, we're doing this on camera. Now, since you're doing the filming, I'm gonna ask you a question. Third grade grammar, how many parts of speech? Well, I don't know, brother. I don't know. Say, say that again, we didn't hear you. I don't know, brother. All right, third grade grammar. Eight parts of speech. Say that, y'all. Eight parts of speech. Eight parts of speech. Now, remember, this is third grade grammar. Now, when you leave here, you're going to go home because we're going to make this meaningful, because we're going to educate the people, not just deal on their emotions. Do you understand? Now, the first thing that is done when you send a child to a dictionary, a lexicon, a book at all, is you train them not to go past any word that they do not comprehend or understand. One of the first rules. Good lighting, clean water. And they never go into a book without a law dictionary, without an etymology on the English language dictionary, without a thesaurus, and a comprehensive dictionary as a standard of operations. That's part of our so-called African culture that we gave up, that we keep thinking belong to the white man, and we're the white man. Do you understand? We need to know what it means. Our people thinks it means complexion. It means legal status, and it does not apply to Europeans. I think, well, I think, um, I don't think people will disagree with what you're saying. Yes, they will. I think, uh, yes, they will. Well, let, 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 let me allow, let me, let me allow, let me finish, let me finish asking my question. <laughs> no, I don't need a mic, I don't need a mic. Um, I think the problem comes when you make statements like pedigree is everything. No, I didn't say that. You didn't say that just now. No, I said status is everything. All right, status is everything. I, I, it's on the, I think you said, but I'm, I'm going to go with what you said, status. When you make statements like that. Why shouldn't I make statements like that? Because it's true. Okay, when you make statements like that, I don't think that the average person, if they study more history, they would disagree. They shouldn't listen. They shouldn't I, talk I, about I, more history. That's world I, I think that what they, I think that what the, the problem they see with what you're doing is, look, they, they, they see you analyzing this situation, analyzing the European from a moral compass, and there's no morality they feel within them. So although on an intellectual level, on a historical level, you may be right, from a morality standpoint, he makes laws to break laws. Right. So they're saying you're right. They're, listen, listen. So they're saying, Todd, you're right, brother. You got it. But we're not. Not dealing with a moral being. So with that being said, all they go out the window. All right, I hear what you just said. Oh, the, the, the morality piece, right, is that 
it depended on what you feel about morality. Not so morality for us, hold on, hold on, hold on, morality for them is two separate things. Exactly. They do the trick out. You mean they write up the paperwork, they get you in the contract, and they break it. That's all. That's all. Now, so I get. So in the perfect world, what you're saying, right? I get that. I get the law, right? At the end of the day, though, if you don't got no firepower to back that paperwork, it ain't worth nothing. Now, this is no. You're not wrong. This is the point. All right, now. This is the point. First of all, over there with the first of all, I'm not measuring the European by moral standards. That that question is flawed, and that's an assumption. But it's usually made by people that are jumping to conclusions without examining what's said. This is what what you'll notice. When you find a lot of our people who really can't read, they also can't listen. Right? So they say I'm measuring the European by moral compass. There's no point that I ever said that. At no point whatsoever. Not only that, if they understood about law that they keep criticizing, it is the Moors who gave that law to the Europeans. It's not the Europeans' law. That's their own stuff. That's another reason why the world don't respect them. Because they keep on acting like the seven liberal arts that was taken to the Europeans that brought them out of darkness into light during the 13th to the 16th century called the Renaissance. They don't even know their own history. Meaning that this is what I'm saying. They're so busy trying to criticize people who are getting working that they're not even paying attention to the history. They're looking at facts as opinions simply because they're uneducated and won't deal with the facts because 90% of them don't only deal with belief systems. They don't deal with facts and they put their beliefs or their feelings. They don't feel as though two and two is four the way you said it. Two and two is four. And I'm not going to apologize for it. And I don't care what they think. You know what I'm saying? Man, and the rest of the civilized world, that's why the civilized world don't like them black people. Because they keep on defending ignorance as fact just because they don't want to accept the facts because it doesn't fit their beliefs. Mm. The civilized world has no time for such savage, dead, civil or mortuous people who dishonor their own mothers and fathers. That's not a moral argument. That's an argument of fact. That's a statement of fact. Now. If anyone has any criticism about the status, all they need to do, like other civilized people, is read a book and go look in a law book and see what status says. Not just for me, that's around the world. And let them criticize with the facts, not with Taji Guy, because I'm only, I'm only talking the facts. And status is everything. Status determines the capacities, the incapacities to any living being in relationship to third parties and the state. And supremely, it determines the rights, the duties, etc., of that person's in and in relationship to the rest of society. And above all, it determines the capacity that one has in relationship to their properties. Now that's law, that's not opinion, that's fact. That ain't because Taji said it, it's because it's fact. And if someone criticizes, don't criticize me because that same person who criticizes it go to Africa and that same status principle will apply to them. They go to Europe, that same status principle apply to them. They go on the street, that same status principle applies to them. One of the problems that we have is that we collectively as a people, particularly here in North America, have not been addressing that issue. Not knowing that that's part of our major problem. Now what they should do is examine it. Let's dialogue for a second, dialogue for a second. Um, pretty much everybody, we're, we're all clear. We're all clear on, on, on all of this. We're, we're definitely clear. Like we've been in this school studying with you and we're, we're, we're all clear on this. The, the, so um, how do we take it to the next, how do we actually execute it to the next level? in the street a lot is, um, you know, why do I need a nation as in, you know, not really understanding what a nation is besides customs, cultures, and tradition, or religion, or language, but the actual organization. I'd like for you to go into the importance of that. Yeah, well, I mean, to start off, we can look at the situation amongst our people and see the disparity. There's economic depravity, there's moral depravity, there's a lack of knowledge of self, and all of those things create conditions, emotional, psychological, economic, educational, where we look like we are naturally deficient and it's either directly or indirectly promoted that we are that. Right. And because of that malady that's operating in society, we haven't learned the laws that we can take control of to reverse that condition ourselves. We often look for a handout, somebody else to make the offering or to come up with a big decision about how to handle that. Right. And that's not how a nation operates. 
a nation operates based on the premise of some historical identity where they have capsulized a culture where they can solve their own problems. All right, so if you look at the body politic concept, advancing beyond just you know looking, wearing the things that, that we know that identify us, we, that moves you into a greater level of responsibility for yourself. We can go all the way back to the history. So we need to understand the history of nationality as it was discussed amongst our people and how it, how it propelled up. All the way back to 1856, you had Edward Wilmot Blyden, who was born here domestically, but was a senator in, in Liberia. Mm. Right? So he was trying to show people back then the importance of nationality, and he wrote a whole book on that subject. All right? And then you had the, who, the people who came after that, like the, uh, the Garveys. I mean, who propelled it? Then Noble Drew Ali busted through the gate and started talking about it direct and bringing the lawful and the legal science of what that means in a cultural dynamic and a body politic. And then we, what we saw in the 60s is our people moving towards trying to figure out the, the mechanics of it, but they didn't have a lot of knowledge, but it was still moving. And you had Honorable Elijah Muhammad who gave a, 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 a context for it with the business structure and the social structure and then Malcolm X, you know, trying to go to the UN. So we've been dealing with this with every leadership either directly or, or indirectly, indirectly right. as a part of solving the problem. But here's the issue. We're making it too complex. If you go down to, let's say, New Mexico, there's places in the highway you can drive down, you go, you're driving through Native American lands, Navajo, whoever. They got schools, they got other things, they got investment in that particular area. You can go down to Florida, they got the Seminoles. You can go down uh, up to North the Dakotas, they got the Sioux. All right. One of the things that we have a problem with is first identifying who exactly we all of the misnomers create the confusion and the division. And if you don't know what a misnomer is, it's a name you're calling yourself that's not historically yours. Right. So that leads you to searching for something that doesn't exist. And while we're on that subject matter, don't lose your thought. Black is a misnomer in to you. Black is a misnomer. African American is a misnomer. Uh, what are the other misnomers that people Negro use? Negro color. Yeah, Negro color. Spanish. Spanish. Latin, Spanish Latin, Latin, Puerto yeah, Rican. African. Yeah, all those misnomers. All those, all those have no historical context and no documents, historical words that we use to associate with us. All right. So now when you come to the indigenous languages in America, you have terms. You come to the indigenous languages in Africa, you have the terms more, miles, and all those things. So, so we go into those particular things. And we can go you know, further back. But the point is, we're here now in said 2015 on the Gregorian calendar, 15,101 on the Aboriginal calendar, original calendar, and what we're saying is we have enough information. We have it. All right. So what do we do with it? We bring people together and we take the, the wheel of life, all right, from the first house to the twelfth house, and we look at everything that's going on. Right. Defense and intelligence, economics and building, networking and diplomacy, uh, family, arts and culture, health and agriculture and medicinal sciences, uh, the legal aspects and law and justice and how we marry and forensics and how we are born and education and uh, the civil aspects of government, the structural components, how we're going to deal with technology and patent, all those things. We're divesting our energy into colonizers. Right. And by doing that, all of the greatness that we have usually just seeps away somewhere because we're not owning it. Well, we so we get one body politic or several, several units. It could be like five of them joints that try to figure out a way and then they find a way to work together. Right. But we get them and what we say is when you invent something, it belongs to the Morris Science Temple of America. Period. And you as the beneficiary. So now all the money you make off of it, there's no taxes being taken by this entity and that entity and that entity. So, so now if it is taxed, it's taxed by the Morris Treasury to bring back finances to the operation of a local uh, state or a national government. Now, the reason why that's important is because I heard Noble Drew Ali say we're part and parcel. Partial. Am I correct? Partial. Yes, yes, Thank you for correcting me. Yes, sir. All right, so in that sense, what he's saying is, okay, we have our identity as an indigenous people, Moorish Americans, all right, and then we have our identity within the U.S. So now, why can't we do business in the U.S. and have our exclusive things that we do in our body politic. Right. All right? It's a simple equation. Why is the body politic important? Because it closes us off from a culture that's dying. Right. And even though we can still do business and understand the law and understand our position in society and go bank and do everything else we're doing, we can do those things inside of our, our body politic that's exclusive to the nationals that send it. If I it could just say off. that. It's Noah's Ark. If I could say that in layman's English. Yeah, yeah, break, let's break it down. Yeah, so basically we have our own Mm -hmm. Not ignoring what's there in place. No, no and not saying still we're not own. saying we're sovereign citizens. Not you know saying we don't got to follow the law. All the stuff that they're gonna see on YouTube if right. they Google this stuff, just put that down. We live in society. We must follow rules, regulations, and order. That's right. it. Regardless of who wrote it, 
it's for our safety in the sense of our, our moral standard will allow for us to perpetuate it without it being uh, an encumbrance upon us. Right. something that brings us down. It only becomes an encumbrance and we're complaining about police shooting us and all these other things if we don't have the body politic to close that off. No other body politic, Jewish, Chinese or whatever, are getting shot 41 times, dude. It's That's not it. happening. And the reason why it's not happening is because they have some form of body politic. Right. When you are a loose cannon out here, the property of the state, and you have no one to look after you, you become uh, undesirable. And then now they can move on you, and the only thing you can do is march and do those particular other things. You can't pull your money. You can't pull this. You can't say, oh, we about to pull these strings. Or you just shot one of us. We're coming down to the police station. We shut it. You can't do those things because you're not organized. You get organized for a moment on emotion, and then you go home to the same misnomer application of the fiction. The, the things that you're doing at home that are not unifying your community. And now on the other hand, because we can talk about them, but on the other hand, we, we I know, and so the streets need to know that you are actually organizing, um, I believe it's in September, mm -hmm. the Aboriginal Summit. Yeah. And yes. instead of coming together, you know, on emotional grounds, hey man, you know, it feels good to be, you know, in the black right. power. And it's like, okay, no, now that we're here. Business. Yeah, because, you know, we have things that are going on in then our communities. And if we really want the uh, external policing to stop the internal policing yeah, yeah. let me so. let me let me talk about let me talk about some of the things that we're gonna be doing right by 2016 we're gonna have our own city hmm. you're gonna be I ain't gonna tell you where it's at you're gonna be able to come to our Aboriginal village and go to the city go eat some food get some soup black some food, watermelons. get some black seeded watermelons mm -hmm. and come back to New York you see what I'm saying that's the type of stuff that we're talking about taking just a small number of people a few thousand people and investing mm -hmm. in it so that we can do something like that right. you know what I mean or coming and saying look everybody that has some form of body politic that's being injured let's come together and make this international suit just to put the flames out so they don't bother us right. you know what I mean we don't need licenses and permits necessarily to go out on the streets on our indigenous lands to go participate in trade and commerce you know what I mean as long as we're not violating and injuring no one or trying to do anything, they, they create things for the subjects, you see what I'm saying, <clears throat> as, as barriers because they don't know that this is their homeland. That's a big, that's a big point I need to make. Let me, let me, let me face to that. You are home. Right. You are home. Like, you're home. That's it. You need to understand that all of our people going by these misnomers need to know you are home. And you are home here. You need to act like you're home. And the first thing that you need to do is clean yourself up morally. Right. right? Because... Although we don't equate morality with the success of having money and wealth in the society because people who are stars can be sniffing cocaine and they can be all kind of other things. If you understand the dynamics of a person who has morality, more than likely they're going to get married. More than likely they're going to get married and take care of their children. More than likely they're not going to be in environments like bars and other places to get into some type of you know, disagreement with another citizen or national. More than likely, they're going to have some type of focus where they want the children to get educated in their indigenous systems or in the regular society. All right. So what you're looking at is a mobile vehicle that knows how to navigate itself in a society based on laws, principles, rules, culture, and you know those things that protect us. So we need to understand that once we come into morality and we're saying, all right, we got a code of conduct. You know, the code of conduct could be the Bible. The code of conduct could be the Quran. The code of conduct could be the per and rule. But it's a code of conduct that holds you to something. Law is something that is necessary for human beings in a social setting to keep them protected. So when you see the fezes and you see the, the kufis and you see the things that people are wearing to represent their body politic, we need to understand that that is a necessity that we have always engaged in since ancient times. That's our culture. And then once we re-embrace those things, life changes for us. Right now, if you look at society, what you have is a, 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 a really immoral culture, right? That's perpetuating with lots of knowledge. So you know what that makes you? For, for, for lack of better words, people don't like the religious word, it makes you satanic. It makes you the type of person that does not respect uh, the fact that if you injure someone else, as long as you're not getting caught by the popo, the police, or somebody locking you up, you're cool with it. You're like a civilized savage. Exactly, exactly. So all we're saying is, listen, man, everybody needs a system of law. Everybody needs a body politic. Everybody needs an organization, something that they can affect. It's a family that you could be a part of that's going to move you away from all of the misnomers and the things that have been impressed upon us, the behaviors and then the psychology that somebody has to give you a handout in order for you to be successful. Right. So nationality and the body politic is a refinement. It's a home. It's, it's a castle. It's, it's, it's a castle with a moat around it. It's going to put us in positions so that we can go. And if now, if you want to run for the mayor, be the mayor of New York, you go get those five indigenous, wherever they are, body politics, we all come back you up.
You see what I'm saying? Now when you get in that position, now you're gonna be doing business with us. Right. You know what I mean? So this is That's a simple what all thing. the other nations do. That's what they do. Well, Noble Dr. Ali had people elected. Yeah, Oscar Dupriest. Exactly. Course. So now they get in, they get into those positions, like Oscar Dupriest and other people. They get into those positions, and now we can do business, we can do trade, we can do commerce. You know what I mean? But everything has to have a level of organization to it. And I think our people underestimate the need for systematic organization. You know I have what a mean? Question. Which is discipline? Yeah. Islam. Islam. What about um? How do we police ourselves? Coming from the Nation of Islam growing up, then I went to the military for the United States of America. How do we militarize and police our own selves and protect ourselves from outsiders? Yeah, we have to, we have to engage in real estate. We have to have the wealth to engage That's in real right. estate. Once you get into a position where you have a body politic, you can look at the universities. I, I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm in what you call Shaker Maximum Philadelphia, and you got uh, UPenn. You got LaSalle, you got Temple, you got all of them have their own police. The only reason they have their own police is because they have real estate. They got all these buildings, so now what do they do? They go down to the government and they say, listen, we have all this real estate, we need to protect our constituents. So now they literally file an affidavit. One officer gets the, whoever will be the commissioner or the, or the, or the, or the or in that position, he gets that, they go open up the police department. So we could do that within the United States or if we have reserve land. If you purchase reserve land, there's a way that you can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you go down to places in uh, Oklahoma and the sheriff is a native. You see what I'm saying? In that reserve land. So we got the we got the duality of both. If we get reserve land or if we in these open spaces in the cities where we have large levels of real estate, we have something to protect. And then if we don't want to start at that level, we can start at a really basic level. We can start in the basic level just like the FOI and all the other groups did. Listen, wherever you have your, your, your temple or your thing, your, your thing there, go out in the community, all right? And then show the example of what it looks like to wear a certain attire because it attracts a certain energy. So when you had the messenger, it was a specific ideology. And then after he passed, right. his son, and then, you know, no, no disrespect to the minister, they decided that they, they wanted to take it in a certain direction, and it had an effect. You see what I'm saying? So when you start, the thing that you got to do is, listen, don't change any of the elders' teachings. Don't do that. So that's why I call it the Aboriginal Public of North America. Because I'm not going to say it's the Moorish Science Temple or the Nation of Islam and disrespect them because they have something that... That that represents, and right. if I got to change something, it's got to be something different. Right. I'm not going to disrespect them. You prefer that have your own, have it, have my own, and then and people. then show the love and respect for them, and take from them as far as the guidance, and 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 you know be be verbal about. Yeah, I borrowed that from the message. I borrowed that from Noble Drawley. I borrowed that from. We can't change the ideologies because what that what happens is it confuses people. So now you get branches. And, and, and you get it breaking up. So that's why people don't see the FOI, or sometimes the Moors have been affected, or the UNIA. We got to recognize that. Those body politics were meant to be body politics, so they have and to become. Not, right. They have to become those things. They actually, like, utilize this. Yeah. Stuff. So this th now this goes into the last thing I want to talk about is the business side. Mm -hmm. The business side. How to contract. Always got to use examples. Always got to use examples. Uh, the slave name Marcus Marcus Counts. That's mm -hmm. what I was born as, right? <laughs> I could go to banks. <laughs> business. First of all, I created a body politics, so now I can get EINs for any entity. Right? So I created a business that was International Society, which is a, a, a subsidiary of, of, our, of our body policy. So now I can go into the bank with that, with my IDs, my indigenous IDs, give them the EIN, give them the indigenous IDs, give them the, um, the business articles, and I form what's called unincorporated associations. I can get various types of EIN. So now this is business education. Sometimes you might need an a, 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 a EIN that's a 9-8 number, that's from a foreign address. You know what I mean? So now you have virtual offices. Mm -hmm. Like you can literally go online and set up an office in Mexico. A virtual office. And you can use that address to go to a bank to open up an account. As long as you have the EIN number, business articles, and, um, and an address. And then you set up a domestic address. That's a P.O. box. Right. That's simple stuff like that. Right. So now you could go in and set up accounts. Well, with if, if I mean, it appears very simple. This is something that the. It's but we train people on this. Yeah. We train. Right. Look, it's look, not, not only that. Studies. See, the thing about it is, we train people on it in society. And then, let's say the more science simple wanted to learn that process. I come do a one day seminar. Everything on paper here. So I got it. You see what I'm saying? That's it. Now you and I, you want that too? Here. So this is what we're talking about for the summit. This is what we're talking about helping with the Millions March. Right. Yo, let's share some stuff because first of all, you can't be stingy. You know right. what I mean? We grew up all from the same conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have empathy for everybody that lives in those conditions because we know what it's like to not have water. Right. Not to have lights. Not to, you know what I mean? Like, so you don't forget about that. Not to have heat. Exactly. So you don't forget about those things. And when you learn something, you have the heart to come share. So my position is we all need to be sharing the greatest things that we have in 
every field. It could be martial arts, it could be economics, it could be whatever, military intelligence, it could be all those things. We need to get together and learn how to share what we have so we can improve each, each one of these body politics. Because you can't go trying to tear down the Hebrews, tear down all these different groups, because it's not going to work. Right. Everybody has something that they attach to, and you don't know the spiritual reason why in their ancestry, in their bloodline, for, for, for some reason, they remember that epic. Right. You know what I mean? It's a reason for that. You know what I mean? Right. The United States and the United States of America, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now when I read the definition of corporation, right, mm -hmm. it sticks out to me that it's the United States. It's a body politic. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that it's corporate or it's corporation. It's not. We're in a corporate construct. Right. And you're using corporate fictions to interface with mm -hmm. this corporate construct. Mm -hmm. And the proof of that is your bank card. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right. The business. Okay, so I right. don't sound crazy. No, you don't sound uh, okay, crazy cool. at all. Okay, cool. All right, yeah. Thank you very much. Because, you know, it's like, I mean... Listen, first of all, stop listening to the sovereign citizens. It's not necessary. They're Europeans. They're not talking indigenous talk. Mm -hmm. All right? What's their nationality? Exactly. We, we, we're not into this threat level, crazy Illuminati. Like, just put that down for a second. We live in a real world. We got to do business. We got to engage in contract. All that. The United States, you know, corporation. You about to get turned in. Just, let's just chill out. It was through the teachings of the Nation of Islam and the Mosan Elijah Muhammad that I heard of the Moorish movement. You know, it was, it was, it was through those teachings and the guidance, and then in, the, in New York, through the Nation of Gods and Earths, 5% Nation. You know, at the time, it wasn't called the Nation of Gods and Earths, it was called the 5% 5 Nation right. of Islam. You know, you know the history. And so, um, it was, that was my progression, so to speak. Right. You know, and I honor all of those schools. I honor, you know, all of those teachings. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, you know, just like with martial arts, you know, you don't wear teachings like a coat. If you do that, you're still at a beginning stage. The idea is to transcend, not not disregard or put away, but to understand and transcend the curriculum and the teaching. Uh -huh. You know, the teaching is to shape and mold you. At the end of the day, you're more important than the teaching. The teaching is to guide and direct you. Um, about Prophet Noble Drew Ali, which is what people don't really talk about, that you don't hear out in these streets when we talk about Islam. What are some of the things that we need to know? Oh, my God. All right. Let's start with just the, let's go get right down to the, the meat of, 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 of what, he, what, he, what he taught. He taught a, no, a lot of things, and we could go a number of places with this. Right. But one of the largest misconceptions, you know how they say the devil hides in plain view. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. One of the largest misconceptions about the Morris movement and the teachings of Prophet Noble Draw Ali is the one thing that most people in the movement think they know so well. And that's what nationality is. And what nationality is not. Mm -hmm. So, let's start with what it is not. Nationality is not a get out of jail free card. Nationality is not something that makes me better than somebody else. It doesn't make me better than. It might make me better off, but it doesn't make me better than. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what nationality is not. Nationality is not some paperwork filing and that you, you know, deal with the courts or on some. That's not what nationality is. I'm about to tell you what nationality really, really, really is. The legal definition, Black's Law Dictionary, everybody hears it. Nationality is that quality of character that arises out of the fact that a person belongs to a nation or a state, mm -hmm. right? So forgive the analogy, but nationality is that common thing, that common thread that you and I have coming up to say, if I came up in Lincoln Projects, you know, especially back in those days, you knew what borough someone was from just by their dress code. That's true. That's, That's a quality true. of character. Yeah. Now, what we're talking about is a group or collective um, dynamic. Nationality is not some individual thing. I cannot have nationality by myself. Okay? That's just like saying you're a gang of one. Because the, 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 you know, again, excuse the analogy, the gang mentality is one of the best examples that we have today of what nationality is. Mm -hmm. Meaning, my actual survival depends upon me being around and with and interacting with my brothers and my sisters. That's what nationality is. That's all it is. It's a group dynamic. It means that the group, the collective, is more important than the individual. And the individual benefits by participating in the collective. So when you hear people talking about, well, I can give you nationality, they don't know what nationality is. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth. They don't know what it is. So, so this is what yeah, the prophet ahead. was talking about. Yeah, go ahead. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. The prophet was like, literally, what is the common ground by which we all can come together and work together? See, it's not just a matter of, let I me mean, think about it. You have a business out here. What supports your business and who supports your business? Our people. Right. So that's what an economy is. The economy is the fact that you have a dynamic where people will come and support your business and you balance that with providing them with what they need and what they want. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So 
it's you you can't you can't have an economy without having a community. You see what I'm saying? You can't produce for yourself and your family without that community. You understand what I mean? Right. And so that's what st comes first is the building and the creating of a community that has a common ancestry, has common experiences, live around each other, and have some of the same issues and the same problems, and then come together and form solutions that will benefit the collective. So people have to first understand what is it. Before. You, can, you, can't, you can't talk about what's wrong with it until you fully understand what it is. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now bet using that analogy and bringing it to the topic. My martial arts instructor will put it like this. Of course in tradition you can ask a question. Of course there's room for innovation. There's room for development. But if you don't understand what the thing is, you're not even qualified to ask a question yet. Do the thing 10,000 times. Do the thing 50,000 times. Then you're qualified to ask intelligent questions. So when it comes to the Moorish movement, and I'm saying this, most people, if the people on the inside, if a large percentage of the people on the inside of the Moorish movement don't know what nationality truly is, how can we expect people on the outside to know what nationality truly is? Mm -hmm. And how can we qualify ourselves to say we need to innovate or change or adapt it when we don't even know what it is to begin with? We still have to figure out what the profit brought us. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Some of us know, many of us don't. And I'm talking about inside the movement. So. When you have people on the outside of the movement saying, well, wait a minute, that might be old-fashioned stuff. Maybe we need to change or adapt it. We can't fault them because they're on the outside of the movement. It's our fault as members of the Moorish Science Temple of America for not knowing and being able to explain the Prophet's program in a way that everybody can understand it. When we can understand it, then we can do exactly what the Prophet said was what you're talking about. He said, to extend the learning and truth of the great Prophet of Ali in North America. Meaning what? Push it forward into the modern time. But you got to understand it first before you can do that. If not, what are you doing? You're becoming a professional beginner. You're just starting all over again with half knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with modifying and expanding and broadening the scope of the teachings as long as we understand what it is we're dealing with to begin with. Right. Okay. You know, and so there's a lot of history, there's a lot of there's a lot of history with the Moorish movement, you know, subsequent to the prophet's passing that's caused a lot of confusion inside the temple. And, right. if, and if there's confusion with members understanding the teachings inside, how can we expect people on the outside to right. understand this and respect this, you know? I got you. Yes, sir. And I'll be the first to say that um, there's a huge amount of, um, because of the decentralization of the Moorish Science Temple of America and the Moorish movement in general from 1929 on to the present day, there's a lot of confusion even with the Moorish American community as to what is Moorish and what is not. So people outside of the Moorish American community, we can't fault if they have an idea or an understanding of the Moorish movement that's somewhat skewed and they have a disagreement with it. We can't fault you for saying, well, wait a minute, y'all might need to upgrade that thing if we're not doing a good um, job of educating and informing you to what it actually is. The idea of the Moorish movement is to bring unity. And we don't mean unity that is glad handing and back slapping and smiling for the camera. That's not unity. Unity is, oh, you develop some economics. There you go. You see what I'm saying? There you go. Now, I'm, I'm gonna be a little critical about, about my own movement, right? You know, one of my good brothers put it like this. He said, listen, you don't see when Italians come together, them talking for hours about the, 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 the glory days of the Roman Empire. Let's, how, can we, how can we develop some economics? How can we secure our future right now in the present? You see what I'm saying, right? Sadly, many of us in the Moorish movement, and not just in the Moorish movement, but the conscious community in general, right. all right. we can do is have a conscious conversation. All we can do is have a Moorish conversation. Start talking about economics, now everybody's pies get tight and they get quiet. There you go. <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I mean? Right. Or if they talk about economics, they're doing this. Well, brother, can you, you, you see what I'm saying? So, so, you know, the idea is unity, not to push each other away. The idea is how can we work together? And unity works like this. Again, I'm using a martial arts analogy, right? One day we were watching this martial arts demonstration with my instructor, and the people who were demonstrating were very bad. They were horrible. And we were letting them know. We were talking about it amongst ourselves. Oh, these guys are bad. They're horrible. They're horrible. They're horrible. My instructor sat and listened to us. And know what he said finally? What? He said, wow, the guy, maybe out of 100 things, he does 99 bad things. I'm going to steal the one good thing. What I want? Made us all look like fools. That's deep right there. You see what I'm saying? Because there's got to be something good that he's doing Thank that, you. Thank that you. we need to learn. Th there you go, brother man. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yes, so, I got so, so that's my brother right there. 
You know what I mean? So maybe I don't like his boots. Maybe I don't like he's got blue on because my favorite color is red. Maybe I don't like the scully he has on. But there's something about that brother that I know I can find an affinity with. And it's on that point that we come together and we work together and enter the house of labor together and help each other to benefit each other. You see what I'm saying? In our families. That's what unity is. Unity is work. Unity doesn't mean I got to like somebody. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Unity is work. We work together. That's the alchemy. You know what I'm saying? That changes base metals into gold. In other words, it turns poor character into good character. It makes, right. a, a, makes a bad man good and a good man better. You see? So, but I, I still want to yeah, address yeah, that yeah, whole yeah, thing. See, yeah. I want to talk about that thing about black, right? Yeah, yeah, All right. And our question in, the more significant question is black corn size means death. And Everybody, including members in the more side of civil America, take this thing as some bad, 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 bad thing. That means black is bad. No. In our same doctrine, I'm talking about the prophet taught right now. He said black quarter science means death. Guess what he also said? What? Now mathematically, if we wanted to equate that to like a, a mathematical equation, we could say black equals death. Okay. Other places in our doctrine, in his teaching, he said there's a holy ministry in death. Another place, he said, death is not an enemy to man, but a friend. So if we substitute death with black, what are we saying? What is the prophet saying? That it's a friend to you. Thank you, brother. Say, Thank yeah. you. That it's a friend. Yeah. Nobody never talk about that part right there. No doubt. Because if they did, you know why, it would make a lot but of sense. You know why, but, you know why, but you know why, brother? One of our teachers it says, while, it says, man and Allah are one. While Allah lives, man cannot die. Now think about that. While Allah lives, man cannot die. Mm -hmm. So guess what that means? If I think death is bad, that means I'm scared of death. I don't know what it is. And I don't know who I am. You see what I'm saying? Now I'm talking about Moorish Americans because we have these lessons. So in your lessons, it's saying that death is not an enemy to man, but a friend. And that there's a holy ministry in death. Right? right? And black according to science means death, so that means there's a holy ministry in black. That means that black is not an enemy to man, but a friend. And the term black describes our condition. It, it does. It describes our condition. Because, like, we talk about the word, the, the, the Arabic word we derive um, the word alchemy from, right? Alchem. People say, well, it means the black science. No. It means life out of blackness. That's what it means. It means life out of blackness. And that's exactly what our prophet taught us in chapter 17 of the Holy Quran of the More Science of America. He said that the body must disintegrate, meaning the ego. Now, we're not just talking about the ego of the individual. We're talking about the ego of an entire people. See, one thing that Minister Farrakhan said a long time ago, he said, you know what our people and other people don't ask? As bad as our condition was made by the European, we don't ask what we did to get ourselves in that condition. As great a people as we are, how in the world did we get brought down to nothing? You see what I'm saying? Right. That's what we don't like talking about, what we don't ask ourselves, you see? So when we say that the body must disintegrate, the body of what? The body of desires, the ego, that that's fixed, has to become solvent. And there's no other people on the planet that have been reduced to nothing the way we have. No other people. And then we say that upon this pliant substance, in other words, this pliant people, Allah breathes, just like he breathed up upon the um, chaos of the deep when the worlds are formed. And life springs forth from death, meaning out of our people, the best the world has ever seen is going to come out of it. Guaranteed, that's what's going to happen. That's, in a nutshell, the holy ministry in death. That's the real science behind black. So no real Moorish American who knows his doctrine, who knows his teachings, should have an issue with the word black. None of them. Here's the fact of the matter, and I won't, get into, I won't have to go into a whole bunch of detail. Just the basics. Prophet Drew Ali got us out of identifying ourselves by names of color. He said we are identified by our free national name just like every other person is on the planet. Plain and simple. So if we reject as a national identifier, notice I'm, I'm, I'm being very specific, as a national identifier, if we're rejecting the name black as a national identifier, we also have to reject the name white green, pink, purple polka dots, it doesn't matter. Of course, the European, and that's what we call it, of course the European uses the term white. And of course it gives him power, right? Of course it does. But, let's be specific. White is not a nationality, he doesn't claim it to be a nationality. See, a, a, a big part of what goes on with a lot of us is that, in another school of thought, we used to say, you know, make your understanding understood. You know what I'm saying? So we may be saying the same words, but we don't have the same understanding of the word. Let's talk about that, right? So, race is not nationality, never was. Let's understand that. You ask a European what his race is, he may say white. Okay, cool, we ask him his nationality. He says, oh, 
Well, I'm Italian, or I'm Irish. And then he proceeds to run down history about his family and about his national group going back 100, 200, 300 years. But he can directly connect it to him. It's not some arbitrary connection like, oh, well, black people build pyramids. It's a little arbitrary. Not to say that that's not true, but if you can't demonstrate the link, maybe you don't need to be saying. So, let's get that straight. White is not a nationality, never was. White is a social political construct. Let's not mix apples and oranges. Nationality is nationality. Ethnicity is ethnicity. If you choose to identify yourself by ethnicity or race, you get exactly what you got right now. It's just that simple. Here's a little piece of information. The American Anthropological Association openly states that the race construct, the color code race construct, is a myth. It's a myth. They made it up. What is the purpose of the myth? They made up a color code construct that places white where? Places black where? So guess what that means, people, plain and simple. Plain and simple. If you are included or include yourself in that categorization, where do you place yourself? It's pretty simple. It's pretty logical. If a construct was made and it places those that are classified as white at the top and those that are classified as black as the bottom, and you are a part now, now, now follow me on this. The American Anthropological Association also states this. You don't get the mortgage or the loan or 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 the job because you say you're black and that there is a set of social um, attachments to that label. You don't get the mortgage or the job or the loan because they say you're black and they have attached these negatives to that label. That is the real issue. If we said to the average American or the average European, are you an American? Or what is an American? And then grabbed one from the 1930s and said, what is an American? You would get two different, you would get two different answers. You get two different responses. Because the term America is very general. Because Mexicans are Americans. Chileans are Americans. Argentinians and Canadians are Americans. This is just the truth. See, there's, uh, you know, the, the scope of education is narrowed for a lot of us over the past 50 years, 60 years. You see what I'm saying? All you gotta do is look up Monroe Doctrine and you see all about it. Look up the Monroe Doctrine. And, and what is Monroe Doctrine? It's basically talking about the unity of American states. American states, or a state, does not necessarily mean a domestic state of the 50 states of the Union. A state is a nation. That's what it is. So when we say state, we're talking about state and international law, right? So Mexico is an American state. Chile is an American state. And Monroe Doctrine basically talks about all for one in terms of American states. That's what it is. You have organizations like the Organization of American States, right? The Pan-American Union. So when we say America from that perspective, we're talking about American soil. A nation is a political unit. That's all it is. A nation is not a group of people that are just occupying a particular particular place. That's not what a nation is. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A nation is a political unit. That's what it is. That's why Mexico is an American state. It's an American state because it's a state or a political unit on American soil. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So first we have to broaden the scope and to get a greater understanding of what the term American is or the possibilities of what it could be. Now the reason why we say Amer a lot of times we have a narrow scope of American now is because of the European. The European, especially during um, you know the 20s, you know the early the, the early and the mid 20s, right? Exercised an inordinate amount of control over the other American states and began to redefine America as talking about the 50 Union, 50 states of the Union. You see what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, a very significant conference dealing with this was the sixth Pan American Conference on Private International Law in January through February 20th of 1928. Now, this was one of the hot topics spoken about during that time period was how the U.S. had. Um, a one-sided understanding of Monroe Doctrine. You see what I'm saying? Where it was basically trying to redefine what American was in favor of the United States over the other American states. And we have, over time, adopted that very same understanding. And so naturally, we'll be like, nah, I don't know, if, if that's what American is, I don't want to be that. 
Does it make sense? But that's come from a lack of proper or fuller understanding of what America is. You can't tell the people in Peru that they're not Americans. Yes, sir. You can't tell them that they're not Americans because they know they are. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So, in our doctrine, in our questionnaire, the prophet said, what is his nationality? Morris America. What is your nationality? Morris Descendants of Moroccans and born in America. Right? Mm -hmm. So, right off, just on the surface, you see it. He says, Descendants of Moroccans, when we're talking about politically, not racially necessarily, politically, because there's no other people outside of us on the planet that are identified by their ethnicity or their skin tone. Why go to Me go to Mexico and you see people that are that, you know of like straight up and down European stock almost Spanish. Then you have the Chiapas that are darker than this brother, right? But what do they identify themselves as? Mexico, right? Go to the Philippines, same thing. Go anywhere else, it's the same thing. Only here are we identified in another way, or we identify ourselves in another way, or we allow people to identify ourselves in another way, and we accept it. So when we say we're descendants of Moroccans born in America, what are we talking about? Real simple, I make it real simple. During the transatlantic slave period, right? The majority of the people were stolen, as the story goes, from Northwest and West Continental Africa, right? Who controlled North and Northwest Africa, the continent, that part of the continent, during that time period? A political entity called the Moroccan Empire. That's just basic history. So politically, who did we belong to? What nation did we belong to before we were called or we classified Negro, Black, and color by somebody else? You see my point? Yes. That, that, and that's the only reason we say that's why we say that. Because if no other reason, if for nothing else, how does the rest of the world come together? Right? The Arabs and the Palestinians in, you know, in, in our neighborhoods, the Koreans, they handle the um um that, that corner of the market on hair care products for our people. What's the one what's the one thing that brings them together? The fact they're Korean. The fact that they're Palestinian. That's what brings the rest of the whole world together. Is that one thing? You see what I'm saying? So go ahead. Uh, what do you say to those who say we are not Moors. Our people didn't call themselves Moors in history. That was um, a name given to us by our conqueror. The European, the white man called us Moors because the term Moor simply meant black. Right. What well, do you say to that? Well, first, well, 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 first, that's 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 narrow, and some of that is incorrect. Okay. You know, you know, um, the the slave master per se did not classify us as Moors. As a, um, the term more or Moorish as it relates to our ancestors has two meanings. One is a general meaning. One's a more specific meaning. Okay? The more specific meaning has to do with a political, like I said before, a political community. A political community. For instance, the entity Mexico is a political community. It's not a race. It's a political community. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, from 6th century on, from 6th century for, for a little over 700 years, you had a political community that controlled North Africa, West Africa, some parts of the interior of continental Africa, and controlled parts of the eastern seaboard in the Caribbean and the United States. This is actual fact history. That entity was called the Moroccan Empire, and anybody under the, or under the, 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 the political influence of that body, right, are classified in the diaspora as what? Moors. Those were Tuareg, Berber, people from you know the, the um, from, from from the Mali Kingdom, Kingdom of Mali. These were all lands that at one point in time were governed more or less by the Moroccan Empire during that time period. So to the rest of the world, what would they be called? You see what I'm saying? Moors. There you go. Does that take away from their tribal influence or their tribal identity? Not at all. Not at all. Because an empire encompasses many lands. It encompasses, right? There you go. Right. Right. This makes sense to us when the Europeans didn't call the Roman Empire, right? That makes sense. But, you know, when we talk about an empire that was run by us, then it's like, wait a minute, now it gets funny. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, now, the other thing with, with Morse, generally, right? When the rest of the world, when you come and bring mathematics, science, running water, libraries to the rest of the world and bring them out of the dark ages, and all they see is you and they associate you with intelligence and you don't look like them, of course they're going to associate the Whoa, name. Right. There you go. I got you. Beautiful. I like the way you put it. See that. what I'm saying? It's just that simple. Now, here we go. I'm going to use this analogy, bro. You're, you're a head of a household. I'm a father as well, right? Who sets the rules in the house? The head of the household, father, mother, whoever, whoever's the head of the household sets the rules, right? You set the rules of the house. You mandate that everybody follows the rules. When they follow the rules, there's peace in the household. But now you wake up one morning and you decide, either you decide or you just forget the rules or you decide you ain't gonna follow the rules no more. 
what happens to the house? It's chaos, right? But even more so, the people that listened to you before not only no longer listen to you, but have no respect for you. Why? Because you were charged with setting the rules and you no longer obey the rules you set. Now, when you look at the laws of nations, when you look at the world today, and how the world conducts business today, no group of people are identified or recognized without being connected to a nation. This is just a fact. Now, that being said, what people taught the world civilization? Who? We did, right? So, can you imagine how the world looks at you now when you refuse to follow the very same rules you set for the world? When you refuse to identify yourself with your nation, with your forefathers, and you dishonor them in name and principle, and cling to names and principles that delude to slavery? Look at how the world looks at you now. If we are the great people that we claim ourselves to be, one thing that great people do is great people have the power to look at themselves and find a solution for their issues with themselves because if the great people are in a bad predicament, it's usually why? Because they put themselves in that predicament.